Hey there, this is Andrew, and I am bringing you a video here, or audio, whatever you happen to be doing, uh, to talk about how to prep for a big Keyforge event. Uh, I'm going to the Keyforge celebration uh, next week, and so thinking about this. And I remember way back in the day, there was a uh, sanctimonious episode that, that I found really helpful. On this topic so if you go back and find uh, the sanctimonious episode on prepping for tournaments I'm sure that would be a benefit to you um, but I want to kind of give my take and also uh, go over yeah I, I do have a few areas where I differ from them especially in like how to play um, there's some things they go into that I won't cover like uh, they talk a little bit about tells and how to spot if your opponent is cheating and I'm not really going to dive into that specifically so or even mind games they talk a little bit about mind games and that's not where I'm going but I am going to get to some stuff about actually how to play where if you're coming in from not having played in person a lot uh, I hope these ideas will be really beneficial for you to refresh your memory but additionally uh, there's some stuff that if you just haven't been to a big event uh, you might not think through some of this stuff and uh, that happens even before and around the games so let's get right in I'm gonna start by talking about uh, some basic bio stuff you decide that you want to go to a Keyforge event let's say it's in another city maybe it's in your same city and you're excited you buy a ticket that's a good start you, you buy a ticket um, the next thing that you need to think about is how you're going to get there. Make sure you actually have a solid plan for that. I recognize sometimes things can go wrong. So in the case of Keyforge Celebration, I'm flying in the night before. Uh, things don't actually start until partway through the day the next day. So uh, if, I, if something goes wrong with my flight, I'll probably just get in really late, lose some sleep, which won't be great, but should still be able to get there. Uh, if things go really sideways, then maybe I just get there first, you know, early uh, in the next day, but uh, still should be able to make it. Some people are flying in that day. They're cutting it a little closer, but, um, you know, hopefully everything goes smoothly for everyone. So then uh, from the airport, I'm planning on meeting up with some friends from California and sharing uh, an Uber or Lyft ride from the airport uh, to our hotel. So that's, uh, we kind of have a, this all planned out. We should be safe traveling together, uh, saving a little money on that, on that uh, car ride. I'll have to wait around for a little bit, but it's worth it to get to spend time with friends and uh, save a little money and, and be a little safer. So, um, so, and then from there, I know that from the hotel to the event location, it's about a 10 minute walk and that's how I'm planning on doing it. I can use the, the walk every day anyway. And I also know that there's some food within the area. Now I might have a friend there with a car. Um, it's possible that we drive someplace, but I'm prepared to just walk everywhere and I'll be packing, uh, expecting that. Um, I know that it's going to be cold, so I'll try to bring some warm stuff for the times when I'm outside. Although I'm a, I have a pretty high body temperature as it is. I'm not that worried about that. Next thing you should think about is, are you going to sleep? If it's an, if you're going to be in some place overnight, probably you are going to sleep. Probably you should sleep. Uh, sleep actually is important to make sure your brain works well and you have a chance at winning. So make sure you think about where, uh, I'm sharing a room with a friend and to save again, a little bit on money, but got it all planned out ahead of time so should be good and like I said it's within walking distance of the venue so not a lot to go wrong there um, all right so you need to sleep make sure that you bring clothes to change into because if you're like me you get sweaty uh, sometimes and you know you want to have a fresh fresh clothes to sweat into the next day and uh, and make sure you take showers uh, and are just keeping up on hygiene because especially you know doing something like Keyforge we could be sit sitting there just sitting for most of the day um, in in a closed room probably won't have a lot of windows open because it'll be super cold outside I don't know exactly how that's gonna work out but it could get a little stuffy I don't know and just 
better to start fresh as you can and because uh, who knows what the day will bring you. Uh, Got to make sure I bring my toothbrush and toothpaste. Um, you know, it's easy easy to miss that one and that can be sad. Usually there's places to pick, pick uh, that stuff up after you get someplace, but better if you don't have to. Uh, and then make sure you think about what you're going to eat because... Uh, it, these could be long days. I mean, these will, these will be long days on an event like that. Any Keyforge event you travel to, you're probably going to have lo a long event, right? Usually you're going to have six plus rounds on day one. I think there's a chance that for uh, that for the losers bracket in the in uh, sealed alliance at at Keyforge celebration, that we'll be looking at nine rounds for the loser bracket. So uh, that that could be pretty intense. That's a pretty long day. Of Keyforge, and um, there are some places within walking I noticed, uh, maybe about 10 minutes walking distance. But depending on how the schedule goes, it might not work out. And so I'm planning to have snacks enough that I could just go the whole day on snacks if I have to. Now I don't want to do that. <clears throat> if I can get out, get something fresh and warm, I'd probably rather. But uh, but I'm going to be prepared if if all I have is what's in my backpack. That'll be enough. Um, that's how I'm packing. And you got to think about water too. So can't bring that through the airport, but I might pick some up on uh, the way if, if there's a store nearby, uh, uh, or at least just bring a bottle that I can keep refilling and make sure that I'm staying hydrated too. Uh, all that thinking really dries you out. Uh, and for me, I'll be bringing my glasses. Don't want to forget those. Uh, very important. Okay, so if I have all that, I should be able to show up and be somewhat nice to be around. Uh, at an event like this, and that's that's a good thing. That's important. So, and you know what? If that's all I did, uh, I could show up there, and if I had to, you know, I could buy fresh tokens from the event venue, uh, buy a deck, just sit down and play and have fun. Maybe not have as good of a chance, but um, that stuff is more important because I could fill in some of the game stuff more easily at the venue. But I do want to pack for the game, so that's the next section I want to talk about. You should bring tokens. Um, for me, I have fancy custom tokens for everything. Um, for a long time, I've used these uh, poker clays that I love, but I think I'm I'm going to mix in some things that I haven't used in a while for damage and uh, and amber because I don't I, I don't really love the clay uh, damage tokens that I have, but the uh, some of the other ones that I have I really love, so I kind of have an eclectic mix, but it's important to make sure that everything is very clear. What it does, usually color is enough to signal, but sometimes you have symbols on them. If you have different denominations for damage, different uh, numeric denominations, then making sure that uh, that you have those, uh, that those are clear is really important so and i'm actually i just upgraded recently i had a nice token box that i liked except that it has a hinge lid and that would always close on me especially if you're in kind of tight quarters i'd have people you know their stuff would always bump into it and uh, i went ahead and got one of the game genic uh token it's not a silo token I forget the name of it but it's a token tray uh very nice with a lid that clips on the top but comes completely off and goes under uh, so that'll be a nice token holder. Um, make I'm bringing my decks. Uh, there's there's not constructed but standard events where you bring your own deck, and so I'm going to be bringing those. Um, I'm bringing some audible stuff too. If I the last minute feel like uh, I think I'd actually rather play this, I'm going to have that. So I'm going to have a few things there. There's a deck that I really would love to play in person with some friends I haven't seen in a while. So I'm just bringing that even though I'm not. Uh, even though I'm not using it in an event, I'm just going to have it available. And so I'll have I'll have a lot of decks with me, even though, you know, the the for the standard events, right, Alliance or Archon Standard, you only need one deck in either of those. But I'm going to have some extra stuff there as well for fun. Um, make sure that things are sleeved. The rules are that your decks have to have opaque sleeves. I personally like to double sleeve nowadays for anything that I would bring to a tournament. Things actually feel nicer to me, double sleeve. They're a little stiffer. 
um, a little slightly bulkier, but not too bad. And so these are the uh, Gamegenic inner sleeves, which are really nice. Um, and I got a bunch of these for crazy cheap in the uh, in the Asmodee um, clearance sale. They were dirt cheap, so I got a lot of these. Um, if you're going to KFC and need some of these and are strapped for cash, I I I'm very happy to keep them because I'll use all the ones that I have, but I'll probably bring a few extra just uh, just to have to be nice to people. Um, and then these are Dragon Shield um, Matt. Um, these are these are custom backs actually with Ancient Bear Republic on them, obviously. But uh, the Dragon Shields are very nice. The rule is they have to be opaque, uh, and the goal is that you shouldn't be able to see the card back through them at all. Um, I know that sounds a little weird for Keyforge decks, but that is that is the rule. Um, and it's also important that they not be marked in any way. So if these had like a, if there was like a divot from, you know, a, a fingernail being driven into one of these or, or you know, one's dog-eared really bad and the others aren't, um, those are ways that someone could tell which card is coming up, right? And so that wouldn't be fair if I could tell, oh, mine fires in my next draw or something like that. So it's important. Uh, they'll actually, at these events, they'll do sleeve checks where they'll take your deck and they'll look at it various ways and the, the judges and marshals have specific routines they go through and make sure that everything actually is correct and that uh, you can't differentiate. And if you fail that, um, if, if they think it's on purpose, then they'll probably just kick you from the event. But... Um, if it's like, you know, you're going into day two and you got a little damage on your sleeves on day one, then I, uh, they would just have you resleeve it. So just be careful about that. Your opponent could ask for a check on that in the middle of a match. Um, that could be pretty frustrating if you have to switch sleeves in the middle of the match. So just stay on top of it. It's good to have some extra sleeves of whatever you're using so that if there is one that gets damaged in some way, you can just swap that out without swapping everything. But I would also be ready to swap everything if that comes down to it. So for me, I just, for a big event like this, I would just start with fresh leaves going into it and have extras on hand to avoid problems. And unfortunately, I wish I could say that the that the Game Genic or that the Keyforge logo sleeves are good enough, but, uh, and, and they are technically, but in my experience, they just aren't durable enough. They actually do tend to break and dog ear and get damaged easily. And so I won't be using those. I'll be sticking with like dragon shields probably. Uh, I really love the dragon shield uh, brushed or matte art. Um, although the matte color is great too. They're they're very nice. I don't like the feel of their glossy, but hey, if you do, then that's fine. Anyway, so make sure your decks are well sleeved. Make sure you have extra sleeves available. Uh, if you want a mat, you should bring your own mat. And uh, you might even plan for having some downtime. You know, if you finish a, a game early, are you going to want to go find your friend and, ga and jam a uh, casual game? Or are you going to want to uh, jump straight into, you know, jump into like listening to some music or reading a book or taking a walk, something like that? Um, you know, bring whatever might help you stay calm throughout the day. All right. Um, the night before, make sure you sleep as well as you can. Make sure you eat well. One thing, going back to the just the food concept, is um, I personally find, and I've heard other people say this too, um, staying a little on the lighter side can be kind of nice. Um, getting grease on your fingers, is that's a little rough. You're going to have to work extra hard to clean them off, which you can do that. Um, but also just generally feeling greasy. Um, feeling bloated from certain foods, not a, not a fun thing when you're uh, kind of in a high stress, could be high stress, uh, thinking hard uh, in, in a space with other people kind of situation. So um, might opt for something just a, a little fresher and lighter uh, over, over really heavy, greasy stuff. But hey, you do you. Um, I just know what uh, I definitely have heard other people say it, and then I, I went ahead and thought, yeah, let me try that, and definitely felt better eating lighter foods. Uh, okay, 
at the event, make sure you show up on time because uh, you can just get an auto loss if you're if you're five minutes late. Um, so you definitely want to show up on time. Uh, be sitting down before you need to be. Um, I don't love uh, the intros that judges and marshals like to give before these events because I've heard it before, uh, but I'm going to be there and sit through it anyway, and maybe I'll learn something new. And good good reminders. Um, basically, it's going to be this video. So, uh, But if, if you're new to it, then it, it might be a really nice refresher. So, But if you're like, I don't want to hear it twice, then stop when I get to the clean play part. Um, but yeah, you definitely want to show up on time. You want to make sure you show up on time to each match. If you, uh, finish early and run out to grab food or something, make sure you know when the next, uh, match start is so that you can be back in plenty of time. Show up planning to have fun. You're probably not going to win. I'm probably not going to win out of, uh, you know, sealed Alliance. There's like a hundred people, uh, at, at Keyforge Celebration, uh, for, Alliance standard, there's like 35 people. So I just recognize the chances of me winning are relatively low. Um, if I do, I'm certainly going to try to win. Uh, I'm going to do my best. And if I do win, I'll be very happy with that. But I'm also really just showing up to have fun and play a game that I love. So, um, so I'm going to keep trying to remind myself of that throughout the day, not get salty uh, and not get in a bad headspace. Because the truth is you are going to bounce back from failure quicker if you are there to have fun, right? Maybe you lose a game, you get knocked to the loser's bracket. Well, you have a much better chance of winning if you stay positive and keep thinking straight. Uh, if you get a chance, meet the judges, uh, make some new friends, say hi to your old friends if, if you already know some people there. Um, if you see me, if you, if you, you know, recognize me and you don't know me yet, feel free to come up and say hi. Uh, I'd love to meet people. Um, but yeah, you want to meet the judges, you want to make new friends. Um, if you get a chance to meet the marshal, that's great. If you have questions about any of the rules, I know for Keyforge Celebration, I'm planning on showing up getting uh, an unchained deck and two sealed uh, and two winds of exchange decks you can bet i'm going to be looking through those cards and trying to get familiar with them before sealed starts if i get the chance and if there are rules interactions that i have questions about i'm going to be asking the judge or the marshal before we start so that uh so that i'm not confused and having to ask in the middle of a game and it can be a little awkward too if you were like hmm should i play this card or not in this situation i don't know because i have a rules question it's a little awkward to call the judge over and ask uh in front of the opponent so if you can sort out questions like that before that's always a good thing to do if uh if uh, then then you want to make sure that you register in time for sealed events uh, you would register your sealed decks and then uh, you get 10 minutes, or actually in the case of Sealed Alliance, it's 30 minutes to look at them and construct your Alliance deck. In the case of uh, Sealed Standard, you, uh, yeah, uh, Archon Sealed. In the case of Archon Sealed, you get 10 minutes to review your deck. So, um, so you show up, you register, make sure you have your Master Vault app ready to go with your profile, and then uh, if the deck is sealed during that time, you would probably want to, well, you would sleeve it up because you have to, um, and look through and make sure you know what you're doing. So sit down and start working on that. Uh, for me, uh, if doing seal, doing Alliance Sealed, I'm probably going to sleeve up both decks completely so that I can easily swap the pods in and out without, without having to move sleeves around. Um, so if I decide to um, do calibration and take out a house and put it in a different house, uh, I'll have the option to do that without having it take a lot of time because I've front-loaded that. That's my goal because you have 30 minutes to review. All right. When you sit down to play, oh, by the way, if you, uh, just back to the double sleeving, if you haven't done this before, I'm sure there are better videos on double sleeving, but these inner sleeves I have on upside down. So the opening is actually on the bottom here. And then the with the outer sleeve, the opening's on the top. Now, some people go so far as to triple sleeve, um, but uh, 
Now, when you first do this, you'll actually get some air puffs in there, which can be kind of funny, but um, you just kind of um, smush everything down and eventually that'll go away. And then the cards actually come in and out a lot easier once the air is all out. But in any case, uh, yeah, that's the that's the right way to do it. Uh, like I said, some people triple sleeve, but the really nice thing is if, if anybody spills or anything weird happens, um, there's actually, it takes quite a lot of effort for water to get uh, far enough to hurt the card. Okay, so now let's talk about you're ready, you have your deck, you sit down across from your opponent. The first thing you're going to do is list review. You're going to take your Archon deck the uh, with the list of cards, and you are going to present that to the opponent. Now, in the case of Alliance, you're going to present all the lists that were involved in creating the deck. And I believe the match slip should actually tell them uh, what you're using, although I guess uh, for, well, no, for for Alliance Standard, that will be the case. The match slip should say what houses you're using, whereas for uh, sealed for Alliance Sealed, um, you're just going to be presenting the deck lists, and then I guess they wouldn't necessarily have a designation of which houses you used, so that could be interesting. Uh, they could tell pretty quickly, like if you had two Saurians, they could tell pretty quickly which one by looking at the at what's on the card once you once they see a card, but I don't know how that's going to work. That'll be interesting. Okay, so you have two minutes to review the list, and uh, recognize that in two minutes you're not going to remember everything, but it's very nice to uh, to remember the highlights. So the thing that I do when I look at a list is look for problem cards that um, that might uh, be a, a, a difficult thing for me to play around. So in this list, for example, um, I would notice um, I would notice Curious Aris and think, oh, um, you know, if I see my opponent getting one amber on a lot of different creatures, uh, I might want to deal with that before the Curious Aris comes out if I can. Uh, there's, you know, Auto Encoder and Novu Dynamo, so I know that's going to be a thing. Um, there are two Mind Fires, so that means that holding cards in my hand is not necessarily safe. I could lose a card out of my hand, and I've lost games that way before by holding uh, too much to protect in my hand and having it Mind Fired out uh, when I probably should have played it a turn earlier. Um, so, yeah, no Mind Fire could be a problem. Uh, know that hmm, there's some good creature control right so just in general all right there are some things that i might have to deal with in here uh scaling amber control board wipes uh these are all good uh, really strong control cards like a restoring guntis or control the weak are things that i might want to know about and remember, uh, and especially notice if they are gone, if they've been played, okay, how many control the weeks do they have? They only had one, so that one's gone. Now uh, now I don't have to worry about them using control the week on me anymore. Okay, you should know how to shuffle well. And I'll include a link to a couple of videos that I thought were good on how to shuffle. Um, but, and, and actually, sorry, I should give a disclaimer before I go any farther. Um, for, for really what the rest of this content, which is about uh, how to play well and make sure you're following the rules and, and not making play mistakes, um, I put my list together um, and then I consulted the uh, clean play document from Time Shapers, uh, which I'll include a link to, uh, and, and filled in missing stuff from there. Um, it's really well done. And so, yeah, some of the things uh, I, I pulled from there to, um, to make sure I did not miss stuff. Um, and then I also looked at the new tournament rules and guidelines to make sure I didn't miss anything from there as well. So, um, yeah, so, but I just want to uh, give credit where it's due. And, and like I said, I'll include links to both those documents. So, uh, yeah, it is worth knowing how to shuffle well. Now, um, I prefer the corner riffle shuffle, and um, a lot of people, what they've experienced in riffle shuffling, I'm not even going to do it with these cards, but if you've seen where people bend the card way back and then, you know, 
fold them down into each other. Um, that's a riffle shuffle, um, and that really bends the cards, and that's uh, that's not great. Um, but it it is really effective for shuffling for mixing the cards and the uh, the science is there ma there's math on this if you do a halfway decent riffle then you are uh, you will have completely randomized a 52 card deck in seven shuffles it will be um, you'll never be completely random um, but it will be effectively random at seven shuffles. Um, with a 36 card deck, I would think that number actually would be smaller. You wouldn't need to do a whole seven, but I like to do a sev do seven just to make sure. Um, and, but I like to do a corner riffle, and this is something I learned from, uh, from my brother, who was a, a casino dealer for a little while. And uh, sorry, this video is a little choppy, but basically um, you are doing a... a a riffle but a couple things are different so one thing is instead of uh, riffling the cards with the tops facing each other like this which would you know the, uh, you uh, probably some of you are cringing right now um, if you're having to draw cards that are different ways that's really frustrating but the bigger problem is actually that sometimes with sleeves one card can end up inserted into another and uh, and then you end up with big problems. So I don't like to do that. You want to keep them side by side like this. And uh, and in both the techniques for shuffling that I'm going to show you, you're going to have them side by side something like this. But in this case, in the corner riffle, you're going to just, just bring up the edges ever so slightly, um, pushing down on, on the outside edge, and you're going to bring them close, and then you're going to let them fall down from your thumbs gradually. Um, and riffle them that way. And what you end up with is this nice fanning. I'm going to pick this up so you can kind of see the hamburger side view. Um, and these are nicely nicely uh, interleaved. And that is a really good shuffle. That's a really effective way to shuffle. And uh, you do not need to bend the cards to do it. Now, I guess I tend to put a slight bend. Um, and that's why I don't do this for cutting other people's decks. Um, but for mine, I do it and I, and it does not, um, you know, it doesn't actually put a, a crease in the cards or anything like that. So, um, so the, the cards are sufficiently flat. Now you want to do that like actually seven times to be thorough. I would not do that with a cut deck because some people just are really touchy about it and, uh, just better. I don't, I don't want that to be, I want the cards I play to make my opponent uncomfortable. I don't want my shuffling technique to make them uncomfortable. Uh, when it's on my own deck, that's, that's one thing, but on their deck, I just want to be respectful. And most people, as far as I know, prefer a, a mash shuffle, which I'll show you in a second. Um, is there anything else I want to show about the corner riffle? Um, oh, uh, the one thing I would say is um, just to... Um, improve the randomness even a little um, I would just uh, even do a cut in between so that uh, so that you make sure that cards are moving between the top and bottom um, okay so having done that that's a, that's a corner riffle there's better videos on that but what a lot of people do is what we call the mash and so um, in the mash you are going to uh, what I the I've seen different ways to do it. The video I'll link actually shows it heals a little differently, but this is how I like to do it. Um, so I hold the deck in one hand like this, take uh, the bottom half of the deck in my other hand, and then uh, just work it in like that. Just kind of uh, give it little, little wiggles as you go, and uh, space will open up and the, the top will fall in. Should not be applying pressure here. Um, but it just goes right in. And this is pretty close to the Riffle Shuffle. It's actually not quite as good, but it's pretty good. Um, and again, I, and I think if you actually just cut, do full cuts in between, um, you're getting a real random effect here. So again, I would probably do this like seven times just to be thorough. Um, and should be, should be good. Again, kind of just a gentle rocking to work it in.
And this is a good, you know, sometimes I'll just nervously fidget and do this while I'm reading their list. Um, now notice the one thing I don't like about this is the way I'm holding it. If you're looking from the side, uh, if you're looking from this side, you're seeing it. So um, I always worry that people are doing that. Now, of course, if you cut well, then that shouldn't happen. But um, and I, I cut kind of like this so that I know they can't see. Um, and I know I can't see, but I just, that's the, my least favorite thing about this. Um, I just make sure you throw a full cut in there sometimes just to get things moved between the top and bottom. Okay. So anyway, that's the corner riffle and side mash. Those are both effective. Sometimes, uh, you see people do a pile sorting. Um, that's good for counting. It is not good for shuffling. Don't do that. Um. It's a sign that you're counting. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, so when you sit down, review the opponent's list, shuffle your deck, make sure that you count your deck. Um, so you should have 36 cards. I usually count in piles of six. One, two, three, four, five, 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 six. Um, why do we count? Um, well, because if you have a 35 card deck, that is not legal. Um, and it is way better to discover this early than late. Because if you discover it early, you might look for the card and find it. Um, if it's very early, maybe you have an opportunity to swap it out. Probably not. Um, although if you're in like sealed alliance and you somehow lost a card, I guess you could, uh, you could swap out the houses potentially, but it's just better to find out early. So I would, I would just do that as you go, uh, or do it before you sit. first thing when you sit down, make sure you have the right number. Okay. Then shuffle, then you present to your opponent. So when you do that, make sure you take the deck, just put it out there, um, and say, hey, uh, you can cut. Um, sometimes I'll reach it across the table, just make it easy on them. Um, just go out of your way to make sure that they have an opportunity to cut. They do not need to ask. Um, if your opponent does not present for you to cut, then you should ask. You should say, hey, uh, can I cut your deck? Um, if they start to draw and they did not, they didn't let you cut, it's a good time to say, oh, uh, I didn't cut. Can I cut? Um, so that's, that's important and you should not be shy about that. You get an opportunity to cut your opponent's deck. When you do it, just do that mass shuffle. Um, don't be afraid to do it seven times to give it a full shuffle. Um, not because you think your opponent's trick shuffling, but because you, you just don't know. Maybe they don't have great technique. Um, you just don't know. So give, give it a nice, give it a nice shuffle. Um, I do this. I've had a couple people get a little bit offended and say, uh, oh, well, then I'll do yours that way. And I go, that's that's fine. You're allowed to. So uh, just don't be shy about giving it a good shuffle. Uh, that is allowed. You get to do a full shuffle and then go ahead and give it a last cut and pass over to them. Um, sometimes you'll see people just tap the top. They'll go, boom. And that means that they're saying, okay, you're, you, I don't want to cut your deck. That's fine. So um some people might do that, but I give it a, a nice mash and then hand it back. Uh, all right. So make sure that you randomize the starting player. Uh, find something to flip or roll. Um, make sure that you agree on the method first. So the way I prefer to do it is just roll odd or even because high roll you can tie and have to roll like five times <laughs> and that's annoying. Uh, but I'll just ask, hey, odd or even? And then if my opponent says odd or even, then I'll go ahead and roll. Um, but if uh, if they say, oh, no, can we do something different? Then I just say, okay. So some people like to flip a coin. Some people like to uh, high roll. If that's what somebody prefers, I just go along with it. It's fine to me. But, um, but I offer, hey, can we just do odd or even? That's I always ask that because that's what I prefer. Um, okay, so uh, once you've agreed, 
do the randomization pick. If you can't agree for some reason, um, like if your opponent says they want a Rochambeau or something and you, that you're not comfortable with that, um, just call a judge over and, and just say, oh, I'm, I'm really not comfortable with that. Can we do something different? If you really can't come to an agreement, then, then call the judge. Um, this is a good time to point out how you call a judge. You just say, judge. That's it. Very simple. We'll cover that a couple more times because calling a judge is important and it's important to be comfortable doing it. Okay, so now you have a deck. You know who's going first. If you are going first, go ahead and deal yourself uh, seven cards. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And get used to doing it this way. This is how I like to do it. I actually uh, deal the cards out to the table, put my deck down, and then uh, go ahead and pick it up look at my cards, decide whether I want to keep or mulligan. This is actually a pretty good hand. I would probably keep, but if I'm going first, I'm going to say, uh, I would say I'll keep, and then I'll ask my opponent, do you want to keep or mulligan? Uh, and I will not uh, proceed until they say I want to keep, or if they want to mulligan, they shuffle and we go through all that again. Um, if I do want to mulligan, I'm going to say, okay, I'll mulligan, start shuffling, it is important to remember, uh, I was playing somebody recently and they, they mulliganed and I think they were just used to a different game. Uh, so they went ahead and drew uh, a new hand and then shuffled. That's incorrect, um, but it was it was casual and I it wasn't something I wanted to call them on right then. But, um, but yeah, if you mulligan, you actually shuffle your hand back into your deck, present it to be cut, and then draw a fresh hand with one less card. Um, and of course, you can only do that once per game um, in Keyforge. In some other games, you can do it more, but in Keyforge, you can do it once. So uh, yeah, so let's say I keep, uh, my opponent says that they're also going to keep, then I go ahead, all right, and I go ahead and take my first turn. Um, now, if you're going second, um, ask your opponent whether they're going to keep or mulligan. It is incumbent on the first player to decide first and declare what they're going to do first. So um, ask your opponent, hey, are you going to keep or mulligan? And uh, and then after they've announced what they're going to do, then you say what you're going to do. Um, I've occasionally had an opponent just start playing before I had a chance to keep or mulligan. And um, if that's the case, then just stop them and say, okay, so you're keeping? And when they say, yes, I guess they would say yes. If they said no, I'd probably call a judge. Uh, but if they say yes, then say, okay, then um, I will either keep or I'll mulligan. I would do that even if you're going to keep because you just want them to know, hey, uh, you got to actually slow down and follow the rules here. And also maybe next time they won't do that again, uh, jump ahead. So um, a couple times I've had that happen. I just say, stop them and say, oh, are you, are you keeping? Okay. Uh, well, here's what I'm going to do. All right, proceed. Okay. Um, if you do mulligan, make sure you go through all the appropriate steps. If your opponent mulligans, make sure they draw and let you cut again. Um, and then when you redraw, let's say I did mulligan, uh, get my opponent to cut again, then I go to draw. I'm going to say, okay, since I mulliganed, I'm now going to draw six cards. One, two, three, four, five, six. And there you go. So you want to be thorough like that. I always like to say how many cards I'm drawing to because uh, that gives the opponent a chance to disagree if they think that's wrong. Uh, okay, now on to during your turn. A couple just broad rules during your turn. You want to announce everything that you do. You never want something to just happen without saying it. Um, this is for a lot of reasons. For one thing, it makes it clear to the opponent what's happening. They may not know why something's happening. Uh, and this way you're telling them they have a chance to disagree. They're not going to get confused. Additionally, a judge might hear it and say, oh, no, that's actually wrong. Um, and there's another reason, which is uh, it just helps it sink in. Sometimes people go, wait, did you do this? Or, or hey, I thought you already did that. And if you're saying everything, then it helps make it a lot easier to track what you have and haven't done because you're saying it as you do it. Okay. Um, so, uh, again, never be shy about calling a judge. Very simple. Judge, raise your hand, say, 
judge loud enough for the judge to hear and then wait for them to come over. If there's something that takes a long time for the judge to resolve, they can give you some time back too, to where if the game does go to time, they give you an extra few minutes because they had to intervene. Uh, but you should never be shy about calling a judge. Calling a judge does not mean anything negative about your opponent. It means you're trying to do the game right. Okay, make sure that you keep your zones clear. So, in a game of Keyforge, you should have your deck, your Archon card, your discard pile, you have, uh, you might have creatures, which might have upgrades on them. These could be a little further forward, I'm just trying to cram everything in here, usually I'd have the keys here. Um, Amber goes on the Archon card. Um, artifacts, I usually stack up to the left here. If I have archives, it's going to go here, sideways, always sideways, because that makes it clear that it's different. Um, if I have my hand, sometimes what I'll do, I have a, I have a hand of six cards here. I'm looking at it. If I'm going to pull my archives, I'll do one of two things. Sometimes I will keep my hand in my hand here, and then I'll look in my archives over here. So I would keep it significantly separate so the opponent can't wonder if I'm doing something like that. I don't I don't want to want it to even look like I could have done that. So I'll hold the the hand pretty far out as I'm doing that or to be really clear, got the archives there, take my hand, set it down on the table. Um and I have to be a little more careful about that now that it doesn't look like a token creature, but I set it out on the table and then take the archives and look at it. If I'm looking at my discard, I probably set my hand down like that, then take my discard and look at it, just to keep things nice and separate. Okay, so you want to keep those zones clear. If you're purging, purge uh, should it needs to be in a very separate area. Um, I like to tuck under the Archon card. That's the I think the old rule said that's where you have to do it. Um, certainly, that's a clear way to do it. Um, and I don't do it like this because then they can kind of disappear. And I think it, actually it's public information what's purged. So uh, it should be visible that there is something down there, but it's tucked under the Archon. It's gone. All right. So what else? Um, make sure you keep your zones clear. Uh, make sure that you announce everything you do. All right. Remember that turns have a set number of... Uh, of steps and you need to actually follow all the steps so the first thing that happens is the start of turn and when the start of turn happens you need to check the board are there any effects that trigger at the start of the turn if you have a card that says you know at the start of the turn uh, take raise the tide um, you need to do that some start of turn cards have may effects like gambling den I would still say uh, gambling den triggers I choose not to gamble or gambling and triggers, I'm going to choose logos, whatever it is. So, um, so you have the choice in that case because it's a may effect. But I would still call it out that you're doing it to keep play very clear, and that way it's it's your opponent actually knows. Oh yeah, they chose not to do it. They don't have to wonder. Um, okay, uh, and actually at the start of your opponent's turn, if they if you have a gambling den and they don't say anything about it. Probably a good opportunity for you to say, oh, do you want to use Gambling Den or choose not to? Um, just so so you're actually being clear and they know that they have that opportunity. Um, okay, so uh, if there are effects, announce them even if you're not going to use them. Um, then step one happens. Step one is forge a key. Uh, you should announce either that you are or are not forging a key, um, and you should t say the amount of amber that you have and what the key costs. So I might say, um, I don't forge a key because I only have four amber and the cost is seven uh, because of your e-die. And that might be an opportunity for the opponent to say, actually, the cost is eight currently because I have two cards in archives. Oh, okay, that's good to know because I was going to play key charge. So um, it's good to uh, say all those kind of things out loud. One reason for this is uh, sometimes you'll get partway through a turn and the opponent will say, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why do you have eight amber? You should only have seven. And you say, um, well, uh, remember, at the start of my turn, I had four. 
Oh yeah, I said that out loud. They heard it. Okay, so we, it's now established we had four. And then I played this card, which has an amber pip. I played this card, which has an amber pip. And then I reaped with this creature. And then this creature fought your creature, which had a captured amber on it. And that went back to my pool. So now we're at eight. Oh, okay. So saying it out loud at the start of the turn actually is super helpful to, to give bracketing points for those kinds of uh, investigations, for lack of a better word. Um, okay, so it's a really good habit to announce, even if you're not forging... And I've also had times where just the amber was piled a little funny and the opponent didn't see some of it. Not intentional on my part, but it can happen. And uh, by saying it out loud, it was, uh, you know, they had an opportunity to go, ah, I see now. And there's just less feels bad. Okay. Um, if you are forging, take the amber that you're spending. So, hey, I'm spending seven amber. So, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Show it to the opponent. Take the key and physically flip it over. Um, by the way, keys have to have a clear, uh, a clear forged and unforged side. So flip it over. Um, I don't actually use these as keys, but this actually would be bad. This is a pin that broke off, uh, but I, I have the pin. I could fix it. But anyway, uh, not a bad key. Um, and so flip it and then take the amber and put it back in your uh, token holder. So very clear. Otherwise, you miss flipping keys. So it's good to be very uh, methodical so that you don't miss flipping keys. I used to miss a lot. I do a lot less now that I have that as my method, which I learned from uh, Mark H. Okay. So, uh, let's see, you forge, all right, step two. So step one is forge a key. You've started the turn, then you have step one, forge a key. Step two, you are going to choose a house. But the first thing I would do, um, ah, actually, let me rewind a little bit. Actually, I'm going to talk about the end of, uh, of step five because it's relevant here. So at, the, at step five, the thing that I'll do, let's say I have three cards in my hand and the my hand size should be six. Um, what I will do is say, all right, uh, I have three cards. I'm going to draw three to get to six. Four, five, six. Um, I'll cover this again when we get to step five, but this is really important because um, if my opponent at, at this point says, uh, actually, I have a succubus. You should only have six. Guess what? It's very clear which is the last card that I drew, and I haven't seen it. So it's going to go right back on top of my deck. No problem. Nobody saw it. Um, it's just not a problem. So, and I, okay, I'm at five cards now. Um, so that solves a lot of problems. So, and then. Um, I'll cover this more too, but during your opponent's turn, you really want to be paying attention to them. So I usually don't even look at my hand during my opponent's turn. So I am going to deal the cards out so I have the right number, and then I'm going to let them sit there not even knowing what they are until the end of my opponent's turn. So then I'm going to forge a key if I can, and then I'm going to pick up my hand. If for some reason, uh, my, if, if my opponent has been sitting on having something that reduced my hand size this whole time and they didn't say anything and now I pick it up I'm going to be really suspicious wait a second um you're only now telling me that my hand size is four that seems a little sketchy um so but you might also recognize something's wrong so it just gives time for things to uh get fixed Without a big problem, again, we'll cover why that's important a little more in a minute. But anyway, so before I pick up my house, I'll pick up my cards, look at them. It's good to notice, okay, do I have archives? Okay, let me let me look at them. Maybe I look at them over here. All right. And then, as you're deciding, you're thinking, how's my turn going to go? I could go this house, it would go like this. I could pick this house, it would go like that. Look on the board. Is there anything that is preventing you from doing anything? Did your opponent play a stealth mode or scrambler storm and you can't play actions? Uh, did your opponent, does your opponent have an ember imp and you can only play two cards? They have a cop. There are a lot of other uh, cards. Did they pop a life ward? There are a lot of reasons why you might not be able to do what you want to do. And now is a really good time to see what those things are and incorporate that into your planning. Um, now, if that sounds like a lot and you're worried about slow play, then that's fine. You can play, you know, you can 
hold your hand. Just know that you're more likely to get it wrong and get penalized for it, which stinks. Um, I personally have practiced playing pretty fast, and so I know that I can do this, and I'm not going to have games go to time because I was slow. Um, okay, having said that, You've looked at your cards, you've looked at your archives, you've checked for things that can get in the way, you've planned out your turn. Go ahead and select your house. I like to point to uh, a card with the icon or point to it on the on the Archon card, something like that, as I'm saying it. Because if I say, all right, I'm going to choose Logos, and I point to Sarian, my opponent might go, uh, which one? Oh, I was pointing to Sarian because I want Sarian. I didn't mean to say Logos. I, I have a problem where I do that sometimes. Um... And uh, so I point to what I want to make sure that I don't mess up. Sometimes I'll even show a card. Yeah, I'm going Sarian. Here's my here's my Faust. I'm going Sarian. At this point, this is not doesn't need to be hidden information. It's fine that my opponent knows I have a Faust. Um, and it, again, if I say it wrong, it's just way better. If if no no, this is what I meant. Okay, the rules are actually a little ambiguous about how you declare what house you've chosen. It just says you have to choose a house. Well, okay, if I say Logos but I was pointing to Sarian, again, I would never do that on purpose, but if I if my mouth messes up and my finger is pointing to the right thing, um, at least I can say, uh, well, I, this is what I meant. Um, I haven't had a judge rule on that as far as I know, but um, yeah, I just want to be extra, extra safe. Um, if you do have archives, at that point you would either say, okay, I'm taking my archives, or and I'm leaving my archives. All right, uh, so now you've chosen an active house, you go on to, and you've either taken your archives or not, you go on to step three, which is play, use, and or discard cards of the active house. Um, some guidelines here. Be clear about everything that you do, and be clear about the, the resolution order. Um, again, now's a good time to just check, are there any restrictions before you try to play a card? Make sure that you play cards one at a time. Um, don't say, um, okay, I play, uh, I play Bot Buckton and Nobu Dynamo. That's not legal. What I need to do is I'm playing, Nobu, I'm playing Bot Buckton and then I'm playing Nobu Dynamo. And notice, uh, as I play the cards, they interplay exhausted. When I play cards, if a card has a pip, which actually none of the cards in my hand do, but let's take this one. If a card I play has a pip, I'm going to resolve the pip first. If there are multiple pips, I'm going to do them top to bottom. Uh, bing, 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 bing. And I'm going to do all the pips first, and then I'm going to do the card effect. A lot of people will do the card effect first and then go back and do the pip. First off, this is incorrect. The rules state you should do the pips first. Um, most of the time it won't matter. Once in a while it does a little bit. Um, but more importantly, you will forget. And if you do it the same way every time, do the pips first and then the effect, you won't forget because you're excited about that effect. You should be excited about the amber too. Do the amber first or whatever pips in order and then do the card effect. Much, much better to do it the same every time and do it right. Okay, so you play a card, you do the pips, uh, uh, creatures that are play exhausted. If you have a creature with taunt, uh, make sure that you push it up a little bit. Um, this creature does not have taunt, but just for example, uh, just so that it's clear when the creatures are all ready that, hey, this creature is actually in front protecting these ones. Uh, that's actually in the rules. You need to do it and it helps clarity too. Um, so uh, yeah, but creatures come into play exhausted. Um, if, if you are taunting, make sure that creatures push forward. Uh, when you reap, let's say all these creatures were ready. Um, it would be wrong to say, uh, okay, I have three ready creatures and wow, this is really behind. Okay, it would be wrong to say, all right, I have three ready creatures, I reap with them, and I get three amber, and then I'll do this effect. That would be wrong. You need to do them one at a time. So with them ready, I would say, okay, I'm going to reap with the Qmex, get the amber. I'm going to reap with the bot booked in. I get the amber. You always get the amber first, and then you do the effect. Now I'm going to play the effect. Now I'm going to do the effect, which is play the top card of my deck. I play it. Um, 
but let's say it's a board wipe and it kills everything. Wow, I didn't get to reap with my Novu Dynamo because it got destroyed by the card that Bot booked and played. I should have done that in a different order. Too bad. But that's why it's important to do things one at a time and to be thoughtful about the order that you do things. Obviously, in casual play, I'd let somebody probably go back and reap with the Novu Dynamo first, but in at a high-level tournament, uh, no. Okay, uh, so you reap. Well, when you reap, make sure you exhaust, gain the amber, and then do the effects if there are if there is a reap effect. If you're fighting, make sure you exhaust the creature, declare the target, exchange the damage, check whether something gets destroyed, and then do any effects that would come from fight. Um, if something's going to die, I won't put damage on it because that's kind of a waste of time. But uh, but other than that, I will certainly put damage on before I do a fight effect. Uh, okay. If there are simultaneous effects, resolve them one at a time and do it clearly. So, for example, uh, you could have a, uh, let's say you play a, you burn a library card and you play Cumex. Well, I'm going to draw a card from the library card and I'm going to draw a card from the Cumex. And I'm going to say which I'm doing and in which order. So, I would say, okay, I'll draw from the Cumex and then I'll draw from then I'll draw from the library card. Uh, and if I reap with the bot booked in, I'm going to say, okay, I'm playing the top card of my deck, Chain of Hubris. I get the Amber. And then I'm going to choose to draw from the library card because actually the play effect of Chain of Hubris and the draw effect from library card would happen simultaneously. I'm going to draw from the library card and then I'm going to move an Amber from the Chain of Hubris. And you make sure you do it in that correct order. Okay. Uh, actually, you could do it the other way, too. You could move an amber and then draw. It's your choice, but you need to state what order you're doing them in. Uh, one thing that I have I saw, I called a friend on recently. Um, he, uh, he was playing Theory or Conjecture, and he, he played Theory or Conjecture, and then he took the top card of his deck and said, and I'm playing the top card of my deck. Um, and, and I told him, I said, you know, you need to say whether you're doing play the top card of your deck, or, because you choose with that card, you either play the top card of your deck or archive the top two cards of your deck. So you need to say first what you're doing. Uh, if you're going to play the top card, say, I'm going to play the top card, play. If you're going to archive, you need to say, I'm going to archive the top two cards and then archive them. You can, can look at them as they go to your archives, right? Um, but you need to say what you're doing before you do it. Otherwise, you could theoretically, he wouldn't do this, but you could theoretically look at the card and then say, oh, I'm going to archive this and this other one too. Um, and, you know, that wouldn't be fair. Again, I know he wasn't doing that, but uh, someone could do that and I want to be consistent. So even my friend who I trust, I'm going to tell him, hey, you got to do the, you got to do things in the right order. All right. Uh, and he, who knows, you know, he could play with somebody who doesn't trust him as much, who would get really upset. Um, okay, so yeah, if there are simultaneous effects, resolve them one at a time. Make sure you're clear about which you're resolving in which order. Uh, if you are doing a board wipe and there are a lot of destroyed effects, consider using tokens to mark it. And I have not seen this in official rules, but I have sometimes, imagine all these had uh, destroyed effects. You know, I might take, uh, take tokens, stick them in front of them, and then say, okay, uh, I'm resolving this one. It goes to my archives. This goes here. All right, I resolved, or actually, yeah, because I did it. That token goes away. Now I'm going to resolve this destroyed effect. I do the thing. Now I'm going to resolve this destroyed effect. I do the thing. Okay, there's no more destroyed effects to resolve. Everything goes to the discard pile. But be clear like that. Um, and again, I don't, uh, I haven't heard of tokens being used that way in an official capacity. I've done it though, just to be really clear in certain cases. Um, if I were probably, if I were, if I'm at Keyforge Celebration and I'm wipe, doing a big board wipe with a lot of destroyed effects, I'm just going to call the judge over to watch and make sure that we do it right. Okay. Uh, if you think that there's a chance you're going to hit rule of six with some cards that you're playing, um, track it somehow. I like to have tokens that I just count up as I'm doing them. Um, some people keep track. Uh, you aren't allowed to use a, a notepad. Um, but I'll, I just find some way to keep track physically so that uh, I don't have to keep it all in my head. Um, okay, if you're discarding, and if you don't know what rule of six is, that means uh, the rule is you can only play 
uh, and use the same card by name six times in a turn. So if you have three Ganger Chieftains, you play one, that's one, you play another one, that's two, and it readies the other one, and the other one fights, that's three, you play the third one, that's four, it readies the second one, which fights, that's five, um, if you had another Ganger Chieftain, you could play it, that would be six, it would ready this one, but you couldn't use it to do anything because you've hit six. If you discard cards, make sure you do it one at a time and say what the card is. Don't just say, and I'm going to discard these three cards. Your opponent needs a chance to see what you did. If you're stealing Amber, uh, make sure that you do not move on until you've seen your opponent lose the Amber that you stole or if your opponent's losing Amber. Um, you're waiting for them to actually remove it from their pool. you got to wait, see it. Um, I've seen people get into trouble with that. So make sure that you are visually tracking. Um, and then once you... And I've had before uh, cases where, again, people I know weren't trying to do the, right, the wrong thing. But I said, okay, I steal an Amber. And they say, okay. And then I'm like, well, you didn't remove it from your pool. Oh, right, okay. Um, and they're like, why, why aren't you doing your next play? Well, you didn't remove your amber. Oh, right. Okay. So these are people I know we're not trying to cheat, but people can make these kind of mistakes. You got to, you know, make sure that things happen right. So if you're stealing or removing amber, uh, don't, don't move on until you've seen it get removed. Um, and we're back. Uh, all right. Yeah. If an opponent asks you to see a card, you want to make sure you hand that right over, let them look at it. That's uh, especially if you're dealing with a new set. Um, sealed on a new set can drag things out a little bit, so um, hopefully you don't get too bogged down in this, but if somebody asks they need to see what a card is, then just hand it over. Some people will actually play, just play like, play a card, put it out so the opponent can see it if they want. Um, I usually don't, because I'm used to playing with people who know the cards, but if I'm dealing with somebody, if I'm, I shouldn't say dealing with, I like playing with new players, but if I'm playing with somebody who's newer, doesn't know all the cards, I definitely will put the cards out this way as I'm playing them and then flip them back around when they've gotten a chance to see it. Okay, uh, so so when you finish step three, you, and remember, just everything you do, do it one at a time. Uh, I'm discarding, I'm discarding, I'm discarding. Don't do stuff all at once. All right. Uh, when you're done with step three, you go to step four. And step four is very simple. It's ready stuff. First, think, is there any reason I can't ready stuff? Uh, if you're playing with Unfathomable, there's a chance that you can't ready stuff. But in any case, you should just check. Is there any reason you can't ready? If not, go ahead and ready your creatures and artifacts. And then you go to step five, which is check for any hand size modifications first. Step five is you draw up to your hand size, but first just check to see, are there any hand size modifications? Do you have chains? Do you have any cards that are modifying your hand size? Does your opponent have any cards that are modifying your hand size? Figure it out and then say, okay, I have three chains, but I also have Zenzi in the middle of the board, but you have a succubus. So that's, Minus one, minus one, plus two. So I'm going to draw six. And then I'm going to lose a chain. And then if you have three cards, you know, you have four cards on the board or four cards in your hand, set them down, face down, and then deal out two more. And there you go. And then again, leave them until the next turn. Um, so here's the deal, right? Uh, oh, so first off, make sure you announce it, right? Uh, based on all this that's going on, here's my hand size. It's... Uh, it's six, uh, so I'm, and I have four, so I'm drawing two. Now, if your opponent then says, hey, actually, you missed this effect that's going on, so actually you should draw only draw five. All right, we know from the way that we did it, we know this was the last one. So we can just put this right back. Nobody ever saw it. It's not a problem. Now, here's how this works. Let's say that I picked this up. I picked up my hand. Now, based on how I picked it up, we know this is the last card I drew. It's standardized testing. Now, my opponent says, wait, wait, you should have only drawn five. Oh, you're right. Uh-oh. Okay. If my opponent 
the first thing I want to do is stop and say, do you know which was the last card I drew? I, I know, but do you know? Check that, because if they say, uh, I think it was this one, right? And you say, yes, that's correct. It was that one. Okay. Then what you do is you take that card and you shuffle it back into the deck. And um, that is not terrible. However, if your opponent says, I do not know, I have no idea. And you say, well, I know because of the way I put it down. I know it's this one. Um, if they don't, if they aren't a hundred percent sure at that point, and, and I don't blame it. Like it's not, if they at that point say, ah, I don't feel comfortable with that. Um, that's okay. Like they're not doing anything wrong at that point. You need to call a judge over. And what the judge is going to have you do is show your whole hand to your opponent and they get to look at your hand and say, okay, shuffle that one back in and they pick. And I will just say, having been on the other side of this, the person who got to pick, it felt terrible. And I picked the way that would help me because that was the sensible thing to do. And it was, you know, I didn't know what my opponent had drawn. They didn't know what they had drawn and, uh, they, they, they didn't know. So all they could do was, uh, say, well, I know it was one of these two cards and I did believe them. And actually one of those cards was one that would have stalled the game out. So that was the one I shuffled in. Um, that's not, this just feels bad. So, um, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't cause that situation to come about. So if you end up in that situation, cause you overdraw, that is really on you. And so what you need to be do doing is draw onto the table like that. If you overdrew, it's very easy to put it back. You don't have to look. You never saw it. And then on your turn, you see what cards you have, and you decide how you're going to play. Um, that's really the best advice I can give you. Um, and just try not to get into that situation where you've drawn too much and get punished for it. Now, if you're playing casual, don't don't uh, treat people that way. Like, um, if somebody says, oh, I know this is what it is, then let them shuffle that one back in. If someone says, uh, I'm not sure, do it random in casual. Um, but in official play, it's going to be the, the not so nice way. Okay. Uh, let's see. Leaving the cards on the table has some side benefits in you paying attention to your opponent's turn, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, so once you've drawn up, uh, then the end of turn happens and there could be end of turn effects. Were there any cards you played that say at the end of your turn? Are there any artifacts that say at the end of your turn? Are there any creatures that say at the end of the turn? Check all that stuff. Think through it. Then think if my step, if my next step one started right this moment, would I forge a key? And if the answer is yes, then you should say check. It's that simple. If your next step one started right this moment, would I forge a key? If the answer is yes, say check. Um, you can go a little further and say, you know, if, um, if my opponent didn't do anything, I would forge. Um, like I can imagine a situation where, uh, actually, so here's one situation. Let's say I have six Amber, but my opponent has a snare on the table and I know at the end of their turn, they're definitely going to capture one. I still should say check. Um, Let's say that um, I don't have enough to, to forge right now, but um, uh, but I know that um, because my, my opponent had used Lash of Broken Dreams, so my key cost is currently nine, um, but I know that next turn it'll, it'll be back to six unless they do something different. Well, then I and I have six, then I should say check. So I would just err on the side of, if you think there's a good chance you forge next turn, if your opponent doesn't do something to stop it, you should say check. Um, if your opponent's board were to get completely wiped, um, well, not counting Amber that's already on their creatures, uh, and, and you would forge, then you should, should say check. So I would just err on the side of caution here and say I have this much amber at the end of the turn, whether you're checking or not, say how much amber you have. 
and then pass turn. Uh, and at the end of your turn, it's nice to say, okay, your turn. All right, what can you do during your opponent's turn? Your hands, your hands on the table, you're not looking at it. Um, you can't plan your turn because you don't know what you have. Pay attention to what your opponent is doing. Know what effects are coming into play. This will actually help you because you won't miss, oh, they, oh you played stealth mode? I didn't know. Um, by the way, if you play stealth mode on your turn or something like that, it's a really nice thing as a start as your passing turn to say, by the way, remember stealth mode's an effect. That's the kind thing to do. You should do it. All right. On your opponent's turn, though, watch what they're doing. Watch what effects come into play. If there's a creature that comes out or something that you don't recognize, ask to read it. Find out what's going on. Um, if it's a card you don't recognize, you probably should read it for yourself. I have definitely had cases where my reading of a card and my opponent's reading of a card differed, and if and you know and that can matter, and then it's time to call a judge and find out you know what the right thing to do is. It could be you're both wrong, <laughs> um, so you need to know what effects are coming into play. You need to notice what cards are going into the discard. That goes back to you know you made mental note of some cards that you might be worried about. Let's uh, let's see which ones go into the discard. Uh, we're paying attention to the triggers that could happen. You know, if there's a, at the start of the turn, do this and your opponent doesn't do it, you want to be able to say, ah, hey, you didn't do this thing. Um, you know, I've had, you know, Soul Snatcher on the board and have a cre uh, an opponent destroy their creature on my turn and not take an Amber. And it's my job to say, hey, uh, did you take an Amber for the Soul Snatcher? Oh, no, I didn't. Okay, yeah, make sure you take that. Um does that help me? No, that helps them. But it, it's both players' job to make sure that the game state stays correct. So pay attention to their triggers. Um, if a trigger is not optional, if, if a trigger is optional and they skip it or miss it even, um, that can kind of be on them. I Again, with a newer player and casual, certainly I might say, oh, hey, did you know? Blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, if your opponent has a speed sigil out and they play a card, they have to put it into play ready. If they put it into play exhausted, they they did the wrong thing. You have to correct them. You have to say, hey, no, that comes into play ready. Now, if they then don't use it, okay, maybe that's on them. But um, but you do need to call them, hey, that actually comes into play ready. Uh, yeah, so uh, make sure you're paying attention to those triggers, keeping your opponent honest and, and correct. People just make mistakes, and it's it's good if you're paying attention and can fix things both uh, to help you and to hurt you both ways. It's just important to do the right thing. If there's ever any confusion, ask. Ask to read the card. Ask. Call for a judge. Judge to find out what a card really does. Um, just don't be shy about that. That is not to be mean to anybody ever. It's just to make sure that the game goes right. All right. A couple more general things. Again, if you're ever in doubt about anything, ask a judge. If you feel like someone is slow playing intentionally, that's not, hey, they're struggling to understand things. Um, this is they are stalling. Um, don't be afraid to call a judge. Just say, hey, judge, I just want you to keep an eye for uh, slow play. Um, it's not being mean. Never do it to be mean or to throw somebody off. That would be terrible, and you can get in trouble for it, rightly so. But uh, but if you do think that they might be stalling, then you should say it. If someone overdrew, um, again, try to call them on it before they see the card if you possibly can. Try to call them on it before the card gets mixed up with other cards if you possibly can. Uh, if they, But if they do overdraw and see it, you should just call a judge over and have them adjudicate, have them implement the, the consequence. It's just going to be better to have a judge be the one to, to say all that stuff and, and make sure it's done right. Um, and be honest, if you know which card it was, tell the truth. If you don't know, tell the truth. That's all. If you're 90% sure, tell the judge, I'm 90% sure. Let them, you know, if they want to ask follow-up questions, that's up to them. Just be honest. Okay. Uh... Uh, listen to the judges and marshals. If the if a judge says, uh, hey, you know, when you reap, that creature is destroyed, and you're like, there's no effect that says that, and the judge says, nope, if you reap, it's destroyed. you got to listen to the judge. Now, if you really think the judge is wrong, kindly just say, I'd like to escalate to the marshal, um, or I'd like to appeal to the marshal. 
and the marshal can check. If the if the marshal says no, that's the way it is. Really, you need to just live with it. That's just life. So, um, I mean, if the marshal says you can't pick a house that's on your archon card, that is what you do. That's it. And maybe you just don't go back to that store again. But um, you need to listen to the judges, and you can appeal the judges to the marshal, but then you, the the marshals say is final. And and be nice, you know. If someone is wrong, if someone made a misplay, there's no reason to be mean about it. You can just say, "Hey, um, actually, that's the way that goes. Here's here's the right thing to do." Um, and if they say, "No, no, that's wrong," you say, "Oh, okay, no, no problem, judge." And talk to the judge. And if the judge says, mm, "I think that they're they're right," oh, okay, okay. Can I can I appeal to the marshal? I'm really confused by this. Just you, there's no need. You're never going to help yourself by being unkind. So be be kind all the way through. When a game is done, uh, hopefully you win. Stay a good game. Uh, if you're comfortable shaking hands, offer to shake hands. Um, in especially post-COVID, some people aren't comfortable shaking hands. That's that's up to them, and you can't demand that someone shake your hand. That's crazy. Before COVID, there were some people who didn't want to shake hands, and that's fine. So, um, you know, uh, just if you offer a hand, if you feel comfortable offering a hand, do it. And then uh, if someone doesn't immediately reach out, just say, "Oh, okay, well, good, good game." Um, make sure you sign the match slip. So at, especially at an official event, there ought to be match slips. Really, I think at store level, you should have match slips too. You need to, uh, mark who was the winner and you need to initial your side. And then the winner should be the one to go turn it in. Why should the winner be the one to go turn it in? Because, um, if the loser is the one turning it in, there's room for shenanigans. And so, um, if I win, I'm going to take it and turn it in. If someone offers to do it, I'm just saying, oh no, I'll get it. Um, and if I lose, I'm going to encourage the other person, uh, here, let me sign that for you. Uh, do you know where to take it? Okay, great. Um, if, if, if someone lost and they asked me to do it, I'm happy to do it. If it's somebody I know, happy to do it. Um, but it's just generally better. There's less room for something to go wrong if the winner's the one who turns it in. Even, even then, right? Sometimes, like, people are tired at the end of nine rounds. Someone signs it wrong. Someone marks it wrong, the winner takes it in, it's marked wrong, and the person at the desk is going to say, did you lose? Oh, no, 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 I won. Okay, can you call the other person over? We need to clear this up, right? But there, even there, like, there's an opportunity for that mistake to be corrected early versus uh, what can happen if, uh, if you have the loser taking it in. There's just a lot more that can go wrong. Okay, after you're done count your cards because sometimes there are effects that move cards between players you need to count make sure you have the right number um, whether you won or lost you want to make sure you did not miss a card you don't want to make sure you want to make sure you don't have an extra card either uh, and then if you have a little extra time just check your sleeves to make sure there's nothing wrong with them and that you're not going to get in trouble for having your cards marked if you do have a problem with the sleeve now is a good time to swap it out and if you're like, uh, I think I'm good, but I'm not 100% sure, just ask the judge, hey, um, when you get a chance, can you give me a quick sleeve check and make sure that everything looks good? Um, all right, that's it. Uh, that, that's kind of long. That's This is an hour and almost 20 minutes of me talking. So I hope you, well, maybe you fell asleep, and if so that's fine. Uh, enjoy it. But if you didn't fall asleep, <laughs> you hopefully learned some stuff. Hopefully you'll be ready for the next big event that you go to, and uh, I hope that you get out there and forge some keys.